Okay, so we're going to start this week with the prayer to St. Michael, the Archangel. So, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Michael, the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Hosts, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the other evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So, thank you all for coming this week. Um, the original plan was to have this, um, have, have all three sessions in the school. Last week, Vacation Bible School had taken over everything, so we had to move over to the church, and I didn't, guess I didn't quite realize how many people we had, otherwise I would have brought out a bunch more chairs. So, thank you, Mr. Lemieux, for gra grabbing a few last minute. Um, so for those of you who were not here last week, um, first of all, it was recorded both audio and video that's on the parish website. Um, fair warning, the first 50 some odd seconds, we didn't have sound, the sound system wasn't on, so just skip that part. It's not your computer or sound system that's broken, it was me forgetting to turn that on. Um, but last week's topic was the roles of the angels and what does the Bible tell us about how they interact with us? What do they do? Um, and so we went through a series of different Bible passages and sort of said, here's what angels are doing in this case and in this case, and here's how they can help us in our daily lives today. So a quick recap, the kind of main points that we covered were for their roles were they sing God's praises in heaven. The angels are constantly around God singing his praises and testifying to his glory so that way we can better know about him. They serve as intercessors and mediators in prayer, um, both directions. They both bring God's word to us in prayer as well as bringing our prayers to God and helping us to pray better. They test us, kind of providing challenges so that way we can grow in our own faith. They bring God's healing power to us whether that be through natural healing or the occasional miraculous healing. Um, and they also serve as protectors and guides throughout our lives, kind of pushing us, nudging us as much as we are open to, to be able to bring us closer to God. So this week, I want to look at the history of the angels, their creation, the fall, and what, are they, what have they kind of done throughout history? What are some noteworthy things about how angels work. So first looking at the creation of the angels, I think the first question to ask ourselves is, so why did God create the angels? Um, certainly God could have done all of those things I just listed out as intercessors, testing, bringing God's healing power to us, etc. He could have done that purely on his own. He didn't need anyone else to do that for him. The Philosophy term here is God likes to use secondary causality, which for those of you who are a bit rusty on your philosophy, that means he likes to use other agents to accomplish his work. He likes to bring other people into his role of creation and basically guiding the cosmos so that they can better know him. Um, the easiest way I think to explain this is to compare our roles with the roles of the angels. We know that God has plans for us in our own lives, um, both the general trajectory of this is your vocation, as well as you know the smaller day-to-day -day plans that he calls you to. Um, and he wants us to show his love for others in countless ways. Some he calls to serve as priests, offering the holy sacrifice of the mass. Others he calls as missionaries to care for those in need and to spread the faith abroad. Um, others he calls to marriage, where their mutual love is capable of resulting in new human life. And yet at the same time, we can say God can do all of that through his own power. The graces we receive at Mass have already been won at Calvary. The, the food that missionaries provide all around the world could be created from nothing, just as God created the earth from nothing. And 
We even hear in Matthew chapter 3, Jesus telling the Pharisees that God is able to raise up descendants for Abraham, even from stones. Um, so I say all this not to belittle the importance of vocations in our lives, but to draw attention to the fact that it is just amazing that God calls us and says, I want you to work with me hand in hand. Just see for yourself how incredible my love is and he calls us to experience his love more fully by sharing it with others. And so just as God creates us to participate in his good works, he created the angels as well. There are certain tasks which are better suited for us in our humanity, and there are others that are better suited for angels. We have a great many limitations, um, as I'm sure you are all well aware. Um, none of us is perfect. None of us is able to, you know, do everything all the time. The angels don't have all the limitations of physical needs that we do. So while we are given power and responsibility over small portions of creation, perhaps a family here or a parish or what have you, um, angels are given power and responsibility over vast regions of creation. Think of the book of Genesis where, or Revelation, sorry. Um, <laughs> Beginning and end of the Bible, you know. <laughs> um, it speaks of angels as governing the forces of all the winds of the earth, or the thunder and lightning, the rains, these vast elemental forces. Um, so this means that the roles of the angels are showing God's power and love, because he is saying to them, just as he says to us, um, share with me this act of creation. Um, the next kind of reason why I think the good, good reason to explain why God created angels is to look at Thomas Aquinas. He saw all the different levels of creation and all the different kinds of things that exist. And he thought, okay, you have within the created world, you have purely physical things that are totally inanimate. You know, this podium right here, rocks, trees. Um, well, trees are animate, um, inanimate things, animate things that lack souls, such as um, cats, dogs. I'm sorry, but Aquinas is pretty strong on <laughs> animals <laughs> lacking, um, immort lacking immortal souls. Um, <laughs> humans, we, who are physical, but have this immortal soul with us. And then he said, yet there's, if if God creates creation perfectly and completely, there must be something that has a spirit, a soul, but lacks the physical component to it, just as there is, are things with the physical but not the spiritual. So we kind of saw that angels as sort of filling the gap there. And he said, okay, angels must have been created by God as a way to show that God can create everything. God would not create a universe missing out on angels because if that he created such a universe, somebody could say, well, there's this thing I could imagine that has these certain properties ontologically that are missing or are missing from the rest of creation. Um, and so angels in that way serve as essentially the highest of created uh, existence that are essentially bridging humanity to God, um, just as humanity is sort of the bridge in existence with both the physical and the spiritual. Um, also, on the topic of creation of the angels, I just want to say angels are created as angels, not as humans that rose to that, to that level. Um, I know every once in a while somebody will throw out a phrase of, Oh, you're you're such an angel, and that is that is okay to use that phrase as long as you you understand that it you mean the person is angelic, has properties of an angel, is kind and loving. Um, there there have been a lot of um, people throughout history, though, who have spoken of angels rather as essentially something we aspire to become which, as I was talking a little bit at the start of last week, we are created to have a body. Um, angels are not. Our bodies are not 
some sort of prison for us to escape, but something good and natural and a genuine part of our being. Um, there was a feel early church father named Origen in the third century um, who speculated that, well, what if um, essentially his theory of angels was that all of the souls originally at the start of creation were surrounding God and then there was one massive fall and essentially the angels were the souls that fell the least, the demons were the ones that fell the most, and humans were somewhere in between. Um, this idea was later condemned because essentially he was denying the goodness of our humanity as humanity. Um, he was essentially saying there is something missing, not through our, not simply because of our sin, but because of this vast fall, um, which he attributes not entirely to us. Um, I won't go too much into his speculative theology and whatnot, but I will just say um, we are created as humans. We do not become angels when we die. We get, we get closer to the angels. The angels help us in heaven and they guide us closer to God always. But we do not become angels. Um, before I go on to the fall, are there any questions on what I just said? I will give you my uh, seminary professor's words of wisdom of, if you have a question, there's a very good chance somebody else in the room has the same basic question, so don't be afraid to ask. So, so angels were already in heaven, and we all are assigned an angel when we're born? Yes, every person is assigned an angel at birth. Um, and so we all or, have yep, our own angel, yep. and then so there's no other, like, you can't become an angel. Yeah. So, now, the angels, when they fell, how did, what happened then? Devil. Well, I, the, an, the angelic fall is actually yeah. the very next topic, so okay. um, <laughs> right. I, I will address that in just a second. Are there any questions? Yep. Yes, yes. Angel is assigned at, at conception. Um, Aquinas does say... Um, on a slight tangent here, Aquinas does say um, that ensoulment and we receive a soul kind of at birth or late term, but if you look at his reasons for it, it's very clearly rooted in his understanding of humans being able to form our, and shape our own bodies, which modern science tells us from the moment of conception, our DNA is shaping who we are and how we form, and so Basically, modern science can be reapplied to his same reasons to say, yes, at conception. <laughs> okay, so angelic fall. Now you were asking sort of what happened at the fall, sort of what, what happened both to Satan as well as to the other fallen angels. Is, am I understanding that correctly? Okay. So the first thing that happened is fundamentally the fall of the angels was a rejection of God in favor of lesser goods and personal glory for the angels. St. Anselm said that Satan sought that to which he would have come had he stood fast. Aquinas expands on this by saying that Satan's desires, he was seeking to attain glory for himself. This desire was fundamentally possible. In fact, um, the fallen angels, according to Aquinas, cannot have desired something that was fundamentally impossible because such a desire would be rooted in an error of their intellect, which Aquinas attributes the highest possible created intellect to the angels, saying they can't be fundamentally wrong. They can misorder things, but they cannot want something that is essentially bad for them. So the angelic mind is created and ordered towards good, and all these different goods. And Satan desired greatness and glory, which we know all of the other angels have. Um, just think of the different descriptions that we heard last week, especially from Isaiah, where these powerful winged creatures flying in the air, singing the greatness of, go of God, there is incredible glory present in that scene. The problem is not 
want recognizing glory as good. It, the problem was that he wanted to achieve it by his own power, not as a gift from God. He didn't want God to say, here is this wonderful thing I am giving you. He wanted to say, this is mine. This is something I have gotten for myself by my own power. So because of this, he fell by the sin of pride, um, which Aquinas says is simply not to be subject to a superior where subjection is due. So Satan and the other angels who fell were naturally subject to God. God created them, bestowed them with countless gifts, and then had plans for them the same way God has plans for us. So God created them and gave them absolutely everything and was so far beyond them, but they refused to acknowledge that. They refused to follow along. Um, and instead were attempting essentially to surpass God, which as Aquinas will tell us, nothing in creation can surpass the creator because you know God is the source of goodness and love and all the holiness. And you cannot, by, by definition, you cannot be more good than goodness itself. Or more loving than loving than love itself and so with that fall the angels or the the angels who fell which was not all of them of course um Re the book of revelation describes it as a third of the stars being swept from the sky and tradition generally holds to about that number um so with that decision to reject the will of god they fell and made a permanent choice. The reason for this choice is permanent um, has to do with the way an angels know things and understand things. So I'm just going to go off on a small tangent of our own ability to fall as humans and compare it with how angels can fall and um, talk about that. So as humans, we experience things and know things through our senses. I look around, I'm able to see this object in front of me. It's tan, has these wavy lines going through it, feels kind of hard. Um, and based on my senses and my previous experiences, I know that this must be made of wood because I've seen other wooden objects before. I can see the shape of it, how it's got this slanted top, a nice shelf back here, and I know that it's a podium. Um, so I'm able to understand through my senses, but my senses can make mistakes. Um, they can either fail slightly, like if I take off my glasses, I can tell that there are a lot of blobs out there. Um, <laughs> oh, and it sounds like they make noise too. <laughs> um, but I can't, a few of you I can tell you do have faces. That's about it. <laughs> um, or that could be a temporary failure, or I could lack um, previous experience. If I had never seen a podium before, I might say, what on earth is this? Um, but I'm capable of learning and growing from my experiences. And because of that, I'm capable of reflecting on what I have done previously and realizing, okay, this sin that I have done previously has separated me from God. And I didn't, may not have realized the full implications at the time. I may not have realized just how evil it was, or even if I knew and it was a mortal sin, I absolutely was darn determined I didn't care at the time, I can change my mind because I, real, I slowly realize over time, okay, it was bad to do that. Angels, on the other hand, don't know th things through senses, which means, in a sense, they are not able to do the reflection be that we do because they essentially do it beforehand. Um, angels, Aquinas says, by their nature as purely intellectual spirits are able to understand everything they are capable of knowing from the instant of their creation. So from the very instant that God created the angels, they knew and had an idea of what it meant to either follow God or not. Um, and so when they made that decision, they were essentially making a decision in light of what we would have gained through a lifetime of thinking and reflecting over our actions 
they already had that knowledge in them. Um, so it's, it's as if they were doing all of their reflection prior to their action. They had been given this vast amount of knowledge by God, and then based on that and their own personal desires, some of them chose not to follow God. And it says in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 393, is the irrevocable character of their choice and not a defect in the infinite divine mercy that makes the angel's sin unforgivable. There is no repentance for the angels after their fall, just as there is no repentance for men after death. So what that means is essentially, it's not that God isn't merciful when, with the angels and ha has certain mercies he reserves only for us. No, what it is is that the choice they're making is a fundamentally different one than the everyday choices we make in our daily lives. We tend to make very small choices that we can then very easily go back and fix. And sometimes, you know, we do make choices that are um, much more difficult to fix, if not impossible. You know, a broken relationship may take years to mend fully, if, if ever. Um, but we also have, for us, a point after death where we have to make a choice for God. Obviously, guided by all of our choices we've made throughout our lives. Obviously, if we have lived a life of prayer and a life of seeking to grow closer to God, then it will be far, far easier to choose to move towards God, who we've been moving towards our whole life. Um, but there is a point where we have to say, this is my choice for God or against. Um, and likewise for the angels, when they were created, they were given this choice with all the knowledge of what would happen, um, of what it meant for them to choose to follow God or not. Um, and now, the next section I'm going to go on to is their punishment, so I hold off any questions on that. And before I open up questions on cause of the fall and whatnot, I just want to say, are there any questions about the permanence of their choice. In particular, I don't want anyone walking away thinking that God just drew an arbitrary line in the sand and said, okay, make up your mind, all decisions are final, and that's that. That, that could be one way of looking at the fall, but it would be wrong, and as, <laughs> as the Catechism says, it is not a defect in the infinite divine mercy. Um, so if there's anything I said that was unclear on that, what can I do to clarify that aspect. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like, and I, I don't know how to put this, but yeah. it almost, I have never thought of the angels as having free will, and I'm mm -hmm. not certain that it's free will, but if they can elect to want greatness or be greater <laughs> than God, then I, I don't because God created them, right? Yeah. yeah, so God created them, and they can seek after greatness. Um, Aquinas describes their free will as they have a limited free will after their choice. So essentially, as I said earlier, their choice is complete and total, meaning every choice and every action they are able to do afterwards is in some way, shape, or form limited or constrained by that choice they have already made. So they're able to act freely, um, but they're not able to go back and undo that choice, if that makes sense. They, once, their choice was not a, well, for now I'm going to serve God or not. It was a, for eternity, I will serve God or not. And so the effects of that choice carry on throughout the rest of their existence. Um, they do have free will, um, they're able to interact with us, um, <coughs> through that, but they're not, they, by making that choice, they have chosen to align their wills as best they can with God or to reject it, God's will. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Any other questions on the fall? Oh. Last week you were saying there were nine different categories yep. of angels. Do the, how do they know what to do with what kind of an angel do we have? <laughs> what we have is a an angel, which is the bottom of the nine choirs. Um, I will actually be going kind of through them in a little bit more detail later, but for now I'll just say essentially the nine choirs of angels are ordered and sorted from, well, tradition generally speaks of by greatness or from greatest to least, and essentially each choir is responsible for passing on knowledge to the next and guiding their portion of creation. So certain choirs stay very close to God and are working with him in heaven. Others are working throughout the universe, um, fighting against demons, protecting us in that way, and others are working us with us in our more day-to-day -day lives. Um, we have the, what's the, uh, the, what level of quality that we have? Angels is, angel? is the simple term, yep. It, which can be a little confusing when you're talking about the nine choirs of angels and one of them is angels, but yes. <laughs> so we can't, we can't pick our own angel alone. No, you're assigned your angel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, are there any other questions? Oh. Oh. Right. Okay. The angels, the ones that fell. Yeah. Okay, we have a choice to do, we have a free will. Yeah. And if we make a mistake, we can be forgiven and we can repent. Apparently, mm -hmm. the angels that fell, there was no repentance. Yes. So the angels that fell lacked repentance fundamentally because, as I said, when they were choosing, they were not choosing for an instant or for a period of time. They were making a permanent choice, um, both because of the character of what they were choosing towards, as well as because of their nature as purely intellectual beings. Um, it's kind of what I said earlier, we're able to go back and forth and think about things. They do that thought process beforehand, essentially. So, I know you don't yep. know the answer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, do you think there are angels today that fall? I would say, no, there are not angels today that fall. Yeah. yeah. Because the ones that have, um, Aquinas actually says um, that essentially once the angels made their choice for God, they were able to enter into God's grace in a way um, that, they, that essentially limited their choice. Um, he basically speaks of it as had the angels known um, or been exposed to God absolutely and completely, they would have almost lacked the option to choose against him. They wouldn't have been able to choose towards him freely. Um, so God essentially gave them that choice without that complete revelation to them, and then step, and then when the angels came forward and presented themselves to him, they are essentially no longer able to choose away from God, essentially. I will say, we went on a slight tangent in my class, um, angelology class in the fall, over whether or not angels are continued to be created. Um, if they are continued to be created, then you can say the ones that continue to be created could still be um, fallen. Most theologians throughout history tend to side towards God created all the angels at once, um, but it's also reasonable to say um, we might actually have continuous creation of angels, especially in regards to um, guardian angels. Um, some theologians speak of guardian angels as kind of essentially being created with you or at a similar time frame as you. Last week you had yep. said that 
Your guardian angel, once you die, yep. they don't get recycled. Yep, your guardian angel <laughs> is right. one time use <laughs> and then eternity in heaven. <laughs> yeah. What is he, go, go like an angel retirement home? <laughs> No, no, your guardian angel is not um, done. They're not reassigned to another human, but they're essentially, the angels help us continue to get to know God even better in heaven. Um, like when we enter heaven, we are not, we are made per. By the time we enter heaven, we are made perfect. But that does not necessarily mean we have every bit of knowledge available to us. And so the angels help us to get to know God there. Any other questions on? I see one in the back. Do the angels? Yeah. Do the angels accompany you to heaven, hell, or purgatory? Um, heaven, definitely. Um, hell, I will say, the angel that is guarding you has already made the choice for God, so. They, they, they end up in heaven, ultimately. Um, and I know, what? <laughs> I, I know um, the visionaries at Fatima actually s saw the guardian angels of souls in purgatory helping those souls and kind of giving them comfort to help them pass through purgatory more easily. Um, so yes, it is fair to say that the gar your guardian angel does continue to stay by your side even through purgatory. They're deaf. I think it's fair to say that they're at your judgment. I don't know if it's fair to say that they are necessarily going to hell with you. I think, or going to hell even for a short time with you. I think it, it's something you could entertain the idea of, but I'm going to say I don't know on that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, any other questions on the fall of the angels? Okay. I don't know why they did it. <laughs> I mean, I like I to think. Yeah, <laughs> I like to think that if I knew what my guardian angel and all the other angels knew at that time, I wouldn't have chosen otherwise. But at the same time, I know what I know now, and I still sin. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. That's true. Perfect lead into my next section. <laughs> Where are the fallen angels? So, the fallen angels are punished in hell. Um, however, they are also given some amount of freedom to act within creation. Um, they're, what? they're given some amount of freedom to act within creation. So, this is everyday. Um, creation? Yeah. Temptations? A demonic possession is a thing. It's rare, but it does happen. <coughs> um, so yeah, they are permitted some. And I'm going to talk about why that is. <coughs> but their suffering in hell is can be spoken of both in terms of physical and spiritual suffering. Um, but the the suffering is primarily spiritual in nature. Um, the way that I like, um, yeah. There's a quote I'm going to read from the textbook we used in my angelology class that I think really gets to just the, it has a very powerful explanation of the spiritual suffering. So it's talking about the demons in hell. They are torn by the discrepancy between their perverse will, that is their desire for a world that suits them, and instead of the real world, and, such, and reality such as it is. Their spiritual suffering, says Aquinas, is the resistance of the will to what is or to what is not. The demons are allergic to reality like a man who happened to be allergic to oxygen. So remember what I was saying earlier, the demons were fundamentally seeking their own greatness through their own power. They were seeking something that is not the current state of the world. Now you or I can be ignorant of the world or we can ignore certain parts of the, of the world. That luxury is not afforded to the angels. They are given far, far more knowledge than us. 
And as such, the demons are constantly aware of the fact that reality does not match their desires. They are constantly aware of the fact that God is greater than them and that they are lesser than God. And so that phrase, they are allergic to reality like a man who happened to be allergic to oxygen, is every moment of reality is simply suffering for them because they want it to be different. Um, looking at their physical suffering, there have been many attempts by theologians looking at how can a spiritual being set, be said to be physically suffering, but my preferred explanation is that they experience something akin to physical suffering, while technically not physical suffering, through the limitations God has placed on them, both by forbidding them to have complete power over creation and also by re requiring them to act within creation in ways that glorify God. Um, so the first is pretty easy to consider. Demons would love to wreak havoc on us constantly through nonstop temptations, physical attacks, um, possession wherever possible, etc. But God only gives them a tiny bit of freedom. They can tempt us, but temptations pass. They can launch physical attacks on us, but only in rare cases. They can oppress our minds and our emotions, but again, that's rare and usually limited. Um, sometimes there are cases like Mother Teresa had famously was questioning her faith and really lacked any feeling of the presence of God for years of her life. Um, and I think it's fair to say that something like that <coughs> probably had a demonic component to it. Um, but that is rare, and of course, we know that she was capable of bearing that suffering because the church has canonized her. Um, the second type of suffering I mentioned was that God requires them to act within creation in ways that glorify him. I think the best examples of this are the times in the Bible, in the Gospels, where Jesus casts out demons and then they identify him. They point to him. Um, the example from Matthew chapter 8, we get the steel the story of Jesus healing two possessed men, but before he casts out the demons, the demons call out to him, what do you want with us, son of God? Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? So the demons are forced to acknowledge that Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. They are forced to acknowledge his identity as the son of God, thereby bringing glory to him as the son of God. Um, and of course, having chosen not to follow God, having chosen to defy his will, they absolutely hate to do something like that. Um, another great example is St. Mary of Jesus Crucified, who was a 19th century mystic um, who experienced incredible highs and lows in her spiritual life. At times, she had visions of the Blessed Mother and of the angels, and she bore the stigmata. But at other times, she was just com felt completely abandoned and had these intense physical and spiritual attacks from demons. And yet, through all of that, she spoke of the experience as something which Christ permitted so that she could offer that suffering for the atonement of sins and the salvation of souls. Even as the demons were trying to tempt her away from God and trying to convince her God could never love her and that she could never possibly hope to be with him in heaven, she recognized that this was a suffering she was going through that could be offered up for something greater. And so, once again, the demons, having chosen to reject God, are being forced to give him glory by their very actions. So are there any questions on the punishment of the angels? Okay, so next up, I'm going to conclude with a little section on kind of the nine choirs of angels and what their various roles are throughout creation. Um, this is, I'm mostly drawing from a work called The Celestial Hierarchy by Pseudo Dionysius, which itself was a work that Thomas Aquinas quotes extensively in his trees on angels, so this is good stuff. Um, and all throughout his, this work, uh, the author is 
talking about how the angels are transmitting knowledge to one another as beams of light, which obviously they're not physical creatures, they're not physical beams of light, but it's a beautiful image to help us understand um, how they're working. And this is actually Edith Stein's um, summary of what he's describing here. So God is the locus from which all that is goes forth. All natural creatures, as well as all the gifts of grace and glory that are poured out over these creatures. All that is, all that is was created by the goodness of God so that it might gain a share in divine being. This is brought about by a ray of light which issues from God and permeates the entire creation so that every created thing and being may turn toward God and be united with him. But this illumination takes place in hierarchical gradation, which is just a fancy word for um, a certain fixed order. The highest creatures, being nearest to God, are the, ones, are the first ones to be illumined by his light, to be permeated by it and turned toward God. But these highest creatures simultaneously incline toward the lower ones in order to let pour forth upon them as much of the fullness as they have received as the lower creatures are capable of embracing. These creatures nearest to God are the angels. They form a hierarchy of their own, i.e. a graduated order of highest, intermediate, and lower spiritual beings. So what she's saying here is essentially God is giving revelation directly to the angels that are closest to them. This is the, um, the first three choirs of angels, the seraphim, cherubim, and thrones. They are constantly surrounding God and are moved by their love for God directly. And then those angels are taking what God has given them these incredible, vast ideas that they are capable of working with directly. Things like love, existence, physical matter, goodness, vast ideas that from there, those angels have the intellects to be able to say, oh, hmm, that's what flowers look like, or that's what the Appalachian Mountains look like, just from these incredible, what to us seems incredibly abstract. And then they break it down. They essentially break it down to smaller categories and easier to understand chunks and pass it on to the next group of angels, the dominions, the virtues, and the powers who are responsible for watching over large pieces of creation. They're not usually not constantly working with us, like the lowest levels of angels, but they're working throughout creation, oftentimes fighting off demons and enforcing the limitations that God has placed on demons or um, carrying out essentially God's law throughout creation. Think of, um, imagine an angel guiding an entire galaxy. This is kind of what those middle tiers are doing as this galaxy is creating new stars, old ones are dying off. Um, and then those angels are processing this information a little bit more and passing it on to the principalities, the archangels and the angels, who are the angels that work with us. Tradition speaks of archangels such as St. Michael being guards for all of humanity or for specific nations. Um, and of course the angels are where we gain our guardian angels from. They're constantly working side by side with us. And then those angels take revelation and pass it on to us. So that by the time it has gone through all of the angels, it's passing, we are able to understand it more easily. This is not some sort of giant game of telephone where the information is getting um, jumbled up as it's passed along, but rather it's like, um, it's essentially each stage knowing exactly what the next stage needs in order to be able to understand this better. And so they're doing the work ahead of time to prepare it for us. Um, and as these rays of divine light, as um, Edith Stein talked about, um, as they're passed on, they become easier and easier for us to understand so that we can essentially 
recognize the goodness of God rather as something knowable rather than viewing it as something foreign and totally outside of ourselves. Um, and that is the basic run through of the roles of the nine choirs of angels. Um, very quick there. I didn't want this to go super long. Um, but are there any questions or specific parts of that you want me to go more in depth about? I still don't yeah. know where those bad guys are. <laughs> 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 oh, um, are they staying yeah. in hell? For the most part, they tend to be limited to hell, but with power over creation. Yeah. Some of them are physically present in our world. Um, but yeah, hell is the primary place of residence, if you will. <laughs> but don't the bad guys go around and try to get us to do bad things? Yeah, yeah. which is why I was saying there are many of them physically in around us. Did I see a question in the back? Yes, um, I was just wondering, does this kind of thing apply in the same respect, like meaning the Bible or the Bible? <laughs> um, so Thomas Aquinas drew his works um, primarily from both the Bible um, and Pseudo Dionysius, who I was saying is the author of the Celestial Hierarchy. Um, it's kind of an early church work that very easily breaks, well, I wouldn't say very easily, it breaks down the nine choirs of angels and what their roles are. So he's drawing from those two works, um, St. Isidore as well, who wrote um, a work called, I think it's the Etymologies, um, going through many, many topics in church, in church teachings, but among them, the angels are very prominent. Um, so yeah, he, he basically drew together many pieces of tradition and synthesized them into one work. Mm -hmm. Saint Michael and yeah. Raphael and Simeon and the others. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yet they do not have any form, so there's yeah. no gender. Yeah. They are able to take on a body. Um, Aquinas speaks of it as condensing a physical form out of air. Um, but yes, the angels lack a physical body to themselves, and therefore, it is reasonable to speak of angels in general as gender lacking any specific gender. Um, some of them have revealed themselves as specifically masculine. I'm trying to think if I know of any, if I've heard of a mystic that like had a fem feminine guardian angel. Um, I don't know of any angels off the top of my head that have revealed themselves in a feminine way. Um, but yeah, it, it is reasonable to speak of them as not having gender. Yep. So there's a lay missionary, Marino Restrepo, and he uh, had a mystical experience with God. And mm -hmm. he, he said that the fallen angels fell in perfect disobedience formation. But just as there's a choirs of angels, this is, this mm -hmm. is not from Aquinas, it's another yep. source thing. And uh, is there, do, do you see any other... Uh, even though there's a third that fell and two-thirds did not fall, two-thirds stayed with God, but they're in a formation. Yep. Is there a formation to the fallen angels? There are a lot of different ways theologians have handled that. Um, and the question of the formation within the angels. Um, I'm trying to remember what Aquinas says on that. I think, I believe he says that the angels do retain some, the fallen angels do retain some form of hierarchy, um, that there is a ordering with Satan, of course, being the primary fallen angel and other angels taking on lead, leading roles, essentially. Um, so they do have a, still a hierarchy of some form. Um, and I believe, if I remember correctly, he also speaks of the higher the, the fallen angels, because they were closer to God, 
in some way and better able to, um, as I was kind of saying earlier, they needed less information to work with to make their choices as completely, and yet they had all the full information. Essentially, their choice was even worse. Um, think of it as, you know, a small child making, we generally we don't hold as culpable for sin as an adult making the same choice because the adult better knows. Um, and so the higher choirs of angels, the ones that fell out of those, were essentially worse off and necessarily punished greater because they were more aware of how creation fell or how they fell in creation. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Yes? I'm just wondering the ratio of God answers to good answers. Yeah. You said it was about a third. Yeah. And does that ratio change over time? If the if we're saying that the angels were created all at once, then it stays the same. Um, if you if you subscribe to the idea that angels might be created continuously, then you could speak of that as changing. Um, that I I would say personally, I mostly follow the idea that angels were created all at once, and it is a fixed ratio essentially. Yep. It was. It wasn't necessarily the lower third of all the angels. It could be no. angels from. It was angels from all nine choirs could have fallen. Yes. Um, do I? It's so. Uh, you may have already covered this, but when did the when did the angels actually fall? Because we talk about Satan. <laughs> Uh, I, and being the fall of yep. humans, right? Yeah. I don't know if I actually um, mentioned this earlier, but Aquinas believes that angels essentially were created good completely and then made their choice in the first instant of their creation. Um, which they, angels also experience time differently than we do. Um, he holds essentially that angels experience time in terms of chronological series. They are not like God who is totally removed from time, but at the same time, he kind of talks of them as being able to almost skip time, essentially. They don't need to. Um, they can act at one point of what we would consider time and then immediately act at a later point if they don't need to do anything in between. But that's kind of the weirdness of angels more than anything else <laughs> uh, with regards to time. So yes, he, he holds that angels, the fallen angels fell essentially instantly. Um, they were given everything they needed in the first instant of their creation and then chose no. Yep. Uh, yes. Eric, can you recommend a book that talks about angels like you are here now? <laughs> That's what, that's what I was going to <laughs> pull up. I was planning to hold this up later, but the kind of textbook for the class I took in the fall was this Angels and Demons, a Catholic Introduction by Serge Thomas Bonino, Order of Preachers, a good Dominican, um, looking at what Aquinas says. For the most part, it's looking at what Aquinas says. There's also a section in the beginning specifically dedicated to scripture. Um, I will have this up here if people are interested in taking a look. Um, but yes, this is a good textbook for, okay, what does is, what is Aquinas say on all these different topics? Yeah. Uh, yeah. In Genesis, yeah. in the story of creation, the serpent then was, one of, was a fallen angel. He was the yep. result. Yeah, the serpent was... Definitely a fallen angel. Tradition generally says this that was Satan himself mm -hmm. tempting. Yep. Yep. I saw a question in the back. Oh, yeah.
Yeah. Opus Sanctorum Angelorum. I would highly recommend anything by them. They're very good, for sure. Yep. Give me a crazy question. Oh dear, crazy question coming in. So you talk about the angels, your angel being an intermediary. Yep. Right. So, so I, I think about, um, and I don't know how other people are, but like, so you're praying, right? Mm -hmm. And you're looking for some answers, and I, I don't want anything else, but I get frustrated. And I'm like, yeah, forget it. I'm going to your mother. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I didn't even go to you. <laughs> so, do you pray to an angel? You pray for yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> the same general answer to um, I'll give the same general answer to that as do we pray to the saints or to Mary? We pray for their intercession, um, but we do not pray to the angels insofar as expecting their own personal greatness and power. We expect God's power to solve our problems as, as the best as God wills and. That isn't always exactly what we want, but <laughs> um, but yes, it's God's power working through the angels that we are praying for. Well, maybe yep. they're not delivering the message. <laughs> <laughs> I, <checked> out. <laughs> I think your an your angels probably taking your messages. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. Did I see? Did I see another hand somewhere? Maybe. Okay, well, if questions are done, then I think we will end with the Our Father, because as my um, angelology professor told us, if your study of the angels ends on the demons, you've gone the wrong direction. <laughs> if your study of the angels ends on the angels, you've fallen short. But if your study of the angels ends on God, you've gone the right direction, the angels have done their job, they've pointed you to him. So, with that in mind, in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank, you. Thank you all so much for coming.